G'day and welcome to this week's video. My name is Robert Gowdy and this week we're going to have a bit of an in-depth look at managed funds and uh, look at why they're not always uh, tax or investor friendly. So over the last couple of weeks we've been working on a, a case where we're looking potentially to uh, sell down a, a managed fund, a pretty substantial fund worth about $400,000 that was invested over 25 years ago. So the first thing that we think about as a financial advisor, that whatever actions we do, we definitely don't want to upset uh, substantial capital gains because that'll be a, a nasty surprise that our clients need to be aware of if there is any capital gains. So. In this scenario, it is a bit of an extreme example. I've had a lot of other smaller case studies and where I've seen in the past and worked on and had personally where I wasn't pleased with the outcomes because of the, the managed funds and the way they've structured and the way they passed on capital gains and distributions to the, the unit holder. Um, so one of those examples was mine, but this is quite an extreme. Um, so just going through the case study, we had an initial investment in 93 of $37,000. All the income and any uh, realised capital gains was reinvested back into the fund. The current value of the fund now is is around four hundred thousand dollars. So um, that's nearly a tenfold return. So it's a fantastic result. And this is not a conversation around asset allocation where you should invest or where you shouldn't. It's more of a I suppose a discussion around whether the unit trust structure is a particularly tax efficient uh, way to invest for investors. So a great result, but so over the 26 years, we actually went through and to had to total up all of the distributions, um, which were all reinvested back into the fund, and that totaled $385,000. So essentially, if we add also on top of that, the, uh, um, the, the fund is essentially made up of um, reinvestments of all the capital. So it means the money's been turned over and turned over over 26 years. So what made up some of those uh, in early years were smaller amounts of money of distributions of income that the fund earned. And as time went on, there was amounts of money of 20, 30 and $40,000, which would have been the realization of a lot of capital gains. So that capital gains was realized um, and then reinvested back into the fund. But the income and the capital gains that was realized is at least their distribution that are taxed at the client's marginal tax rate. So if I assume um, you're on the total amount of uh, money that's income and distributed capital gains that have been reinvested in the fund of about uh, 385,000 at 20%, well, that's 77 grand uh, worth of tax that that client has had to pay out of their own pocket because all the money was reinvested into the fund um, over that 26 time frame, uh, 20 years, uh, 26 years. So not very tax efficient for the client, and that is because the fund manager um, is making decisions on when to buy and hold, um, and obviously when when to sell. And when they sell, they're often realizing these capital gains. Those capital gains have to be distributed out to the uh, to the uh, unit holders, the investors, uh, and that's where there's a, a tax element to that. Now, in the past, I've seen. Uh, some clients where this is going back probably about 18 years when I was pretty green at what I was doing, that at the start of June, say we invested $40,000 for a client. This is a real life example. And then that uh, at the end of June, uh, the fund manager distributes all the capital gains realized throughout the year. So unbeknownst to me at the time as a very young financial advisor, that when we invested that client into the fund with only less than 30 days to go to the end of the financial year they were actually inheriting all the capital you know the unrealized capital gains from the previous investors uh, that sit within the, the trust itself so when they got their tax return from the fund and took it to the accountant that affected the low income tax offset it affected some centrelink benefits all for a fund that probably didn't grow at all over that time frame but they just copped all the income and capital gains for that financial year at the end of June. So obviously, yeah, more experience we get, the more we learn. So what should we be wary of? Well, managed funds that have high turnover, as long as you understand that a managed fund, uh, they're active and there's going to be high turnover, these figures are often, um, uh, you know, are 
within their publication, how often they think they'll turn over their funds. Is it 100% of the fund each year or 30% or 40%? Um, so if you're aware of that turnover um, and you know there might be tax consequences, that's fine. Um, but please be aware. Index funds are not going to sort of give you that problem because you know they're in there buying, uh, and it's only the 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 companies at the sort of the fringes, um, you know, the top 200. It'll be the ones at the fringe that are falling in and out that they have to buy and sell. Um, and yeah, for those that have a tax rate anything above the superannuation uh, tax pension tax rate of zero percent, there is tax uh, implications. So if you're investing in your own name um, and you're earning a reasonable wage, $60,000, $70,000, your marginal tax rate on that money is 34%, uh, 34.5%, you may be better off actually investing directly um, where you can you know, control and monitor obviously the capital gains and also capital losses uh, more, more efficiently. So managed funds have their place, great for diversification with small amounts of money, but there are some flaws. You do inherit uh, the, you know, the capital gains, unrealized capital gains and potential tax liabilities that come along with the trusts that have been potentially in existence for 10 or 20 years. So hope that hope that's helpful. Um, thank you very much for listening and we'll catch you next week. Thank you, bye.